I'm a clinical psychologist. I've been in practice now, believe it or not, 30 years. So I started when I was 15. I'm joking. Uh, I've been in practice a long time. And I think part of my education I need to talk about is I was a policeman in my former life from ages 23 to 31. And that really shaped a lot of what I do as a psychologist. Because many times we'd come to these scenes, and whether it be a death notice or a murder, and you talk to the families, and we got to leave. I used to think, who's going to clean up the emotional mess? Who's going to help these people overcome their son got shot in a gang um, shooting or, you know, it's stillborn baby. I, that stuff really hit me. And the other thing was about fatherless sons. And we'll get into that more, but I was part of my education. I went to a seminary, got a master's theology from Fuller Seminary, and then got my PhD in um, clinical psychology from the Chicago School of Psychology. And I've been in practice, like I said, for quite a while. And I work uh, with men all ages, starting about age 10, I currently have a gentleman who's just turned 90. So, you know, the process never stops. In your book, Modern Masculinity, you offer men a new way to conceive of masculinity. Why did you think this was necessary? The full title of the book is Modern Masculinity, a compassionate guidebook to men's mental health. I wrote a book back in 2019 that came out, The Shame Factor, How to Heal Your Deepest Fears and Set Yourself Free. And then the shutdown came of 2020. And I found that a lot of men, all ages, the old rule book no longer applied. You know, make money, be successful, and everything else works. What I have seen in my practice, a lot of young men, whether come out of college in their 30s, 40s, and made a killing financially, and they feel worse. Guys ask me all the time, men like to have a plan. Like, how are we going to do this? Tell me something we can do. How can I fix this? And I talk, there's four pieces to your masculinity. And the first piece is self-acceptance. And self-acceptance is learning to sit with the parts of you you don't like. And you sit with it long enough to it creates humility. When you have humility, you have a superpower. Because you're no longer seeking approval or attention. You're humble. And that allows you to develop empathy. And that is to read people and connect with them on what they're doing, how they're feeling. You have boundaries, but you can relate to people. And those two pieces lean to the third piece, um, having a plan, a life plan. Like what I want to do. People say, well, I don't know. I don't have a purpose. I don't have a plan. What will you do? You're following some plan, whether it be conscious, way back here or up here. There's a plan. And the fourth piece of it is realizing that you're important and that there's something bigger than you going on. You're bigger than just yourself and having regard for the greater good and that mindfulness allows men to stay balanced. And all four pieces, I call them the four horsemen, create balance because your mental health is your physical health, your relational health, uh, your emotional health. All of that, you know, your mental health is your invisible body, as is our skin, is our physical health. And the two are inner, interrelated, interconnected. So that's what got me to write the book. And I know it's a long, long-winded answer, but men want to know, what do I do? Hand me something. You know, I'm 22. I just graduated from college. And my dad, my parents say, well, just figure it out. And my generation, guys over 50 or 60, what we did doesn't work for the younger men. Younger men are insightful. They, they want to feel better. And the old school where if you have money and position, you're privileged. That no longer works. And that's where the Me Too movement came in. I tell Matt, was, that's our best friend. Because it woke up sleeping dogs that needed to wake up. And younger men under 35, they want us, older guys, to say, hey, this is how to do it. We didn't do it correctly, but we're doing it better now. And these are the tools that you can internalize. Because masculinity is internal. Adult development is internal. It's not external. And I think that's part of the problem why so many men feel a lot. Because they do it externally. You know, I get this job, this house, this partner, kids, cars. And all of a sudden, they're 41, 42, 50, and they feel empty. Like, what's it all for? That's what modern masculinity is about, is the inward journey, the hero's journey, to find your purpose and who you are. And during the shutdown, I've never been so busy in my life. I had more men call me, that I, ones I'd never met, hadn't spoken to in years. They're like, what am I going to do? Well, you're doing the right thing. Go inside. Everything you want is inside of you. You're going to figure this out.
You discuss toxic masculinity and its impact on not only men, but families and society. How do you define toxic masculinity? Toxic masculinity is the absence of masculinity. It sounds redundant, but it's the absence of self-acceptance and humility and empathy. Just those two pieces alone. You cannot be self-centered, abusive, exploitive, because you're doing it to yourself, and you're not going to do it to yourself. Toxic is it's destructive. Now, there's narcissistic masculinity, which is kind of like on this getting toward toxic, but toxic is a lack of personal development in the role, uh, whether it be position, power, or relationship, where a man has not discovered or done the work on himself, and he's acting it out externally, not internally. And that's part of what we uh, take head on in the book. You can choose. You may be toxic. You can choose not to be. All through the book, it's never too late to change. Or you know, the other saying, it's never too early to change. But toxic is the absence of compassionate, high-functioning masculinity. It's a complete absence of it. Why are men so angry and aggressive? Many times when a man is angry and aggressive, that's a secondary emotion. They're feeling powerless. And I always wonder, what's underneath? What's that covering up? What deep, deep disappointment or trauma is getting covered up with mud? You know, people talk about anger management. I call it shame management. Because aggression is secondary. That's a result of not feeling good about yourself. Or feeling unloved, uh, abused. There's something driving, fueling that. Something's funding that abuse. And men, unfortunately, externalize their rage where women will internalize it. They'll, you know, they'll internalize and blame themselves. And I always say, how many mass murderers are women? Exactly. Can't name one. But we can name a lot of men because they take their rage out on the world as a way of trying to heal this. And the, and the problem is it's the Grand Canyon. It just keeps getting bigger. We're ultimately leads to self-destruction and suicide. Or homicide. It's very unfortunate. But that's where the aggression goes if it's not checked. Emotional intelligence is key to your understanding of what a healthy masculinity looks like. How did men become emotionally unintelligent and how can they address this? <laughs> it's such a hard question. Because men emotionally unintelligent, it's true, illiterate, emotionally illiterate. And what it is, but since the Industrial Revolution, there's been this migration from the from the farm into the city and you're judged men are the worst with men by the way it's not women men the brotherhood are brutal male humor is treacherous you know uh, the emotional intelligence is it's the it's not a luxury item men viewed as a luxury item and they're like in handcuffs you're either silent or you're enraged everything else in between if you if you express that you're weak, you're not man enough, man up, men don't cry, men don't feel it. Well, that's the reason why 900 men today will die from a heart attack, not related to health, because your emotions have to go somewhere. And over time, it's going to cannibalize you. Emotional intelligence is the ability to connect to yourself, to know what's going on in here. And I'll ask, man, what are you thinking? I don't know. Yes, you do. Let's take a moment. And it's so uncomfortable, but you learn to sit with it. You're Emotional IQ increases, and that's what your partner wants because it breeds compassion and empathy for yourself and others. But it's been viewed as a luxury item, not as a masculine item, and that's what's changing. Men are realizing that. Men go to therapy for that reason. Men go to the gym. It's all the same. Having a coach, it's all related. Throughout Modern Masculinity, you discuss the destructive impact of shame on men. Why do so many men feel such intense levels of shame and how does this affect them and the people around them? It goes back to that point where if I graduate my MBA or I Wharton School of Business or I run a hedge fund, this will be okay. It's not. It's, it's not that those pieces aren't important, but it's only 10, that's only 10% of the pie, at most 10%. And shame starts about age five, where either we feel competent or inferior by age five you can see it on um, kindergarten teachers first grade teacher elementary school they can tell you what kids feel like they're inferior other kids that feel competent not arrogant just competent like i can learn to read write arithmetic 
do that. And men don't know to do that uncomfortable feeling. I'm bad. I'm not good enough. I'm defective. And that shame we think will get eradicated if I do stuff externally. It'll never leave there. Going to the doctors won't heal cancer. Cancer has to be done from within. And shame is emotional cancer. It will take complete control of your life if you don't manage it. And that's why so many men dismiss it. But that gaping wound shows up in your relationships with your partner, with your kids, your colleagues. It keeps going. And you can't take feedback because I'm not good enough. Well, you are good enough, but you got to pull it out by the roots. That's why men avoid it so much because they think they can heal it on the outside. You can't. It's an inward journey. The public is generally unaware of how many men suffer from eating disorders. What are the facts on this and how can men address issues with food? You know, part of the eating disorder issue is it's a universal belief that men don't have eating disorders. And they do. International Journal of Eating Disorders in 2019 estimated that 25% of all eating disorders are men not diagnosed because the obsession with we call it the adonis complex steroids working out which is it's great you work out but the eating disorder is the, this belief that there's a perfect looking masculine man like he's cut he's thin whatever it may mean you know he's an nfl football whatever it may mean and guys will starve themselves as a as a sign of strength that they're strong enough i can do this but what happens is they're starving themselves literally to death and damaging their bodies. And eating, disor eating disorders for men are very difficult because men have this belief that, well, that's, that's for women. Women do that. No, people do that. It's a people issue and it's a control issue too. You are very clear that men must end the cycles of violence that they have perpetrated for years. To what do you attribute men's violence and what are steps that every man can take to end it? One of the things is the brotherhood. Men know men who are dangerous, but men will avoid that guy because they're scared of him. And that's part of the problem is that we enable these men to act out, to be violent, to uh, be bullies. And violence is driven by nonverbal rage. Nonverbal, I mean, they don't know how to express it. So they, like kids in, you know, in preschool, don't hit, don't bite, use your words. It sounds so elementary, but the, the violence is a form of not using your words. And it's fueled by shame. I feel terrible and I got to get rid of that feeling. So I'm going to beat it out of you or I'm going to kill that feeling with a violent action. And that's what happened. It's very scary. And lastly, it exposes the trauma of what's going on in your life. Violence is, again, men acting out their shame. Are you, am I saying all things are shame-driven? I'll say 80%, 90%. Now, there's mental health issues, but I'm telling you, men know who men are dangerous. I want to give you an anecdotal story. This last fall, I'm at the gym. It's on a Thursday night about 9 p.m. The gym's closing. We're all in the locker room, changing clothes, and I have on a shirt. It says uh, USC on it, and this guy across the room goes, hey, SC, your quarterback's a pansy. Oh. So I pretend I don't hear him. I pretend I don't hear him. He goes, hey, he is, quote, a pussy. I go, hey, because he has emotion and expresses it, does it make him weak? He goes, really? I go, yeah, really? It took courage to let that out. That's a passionate young man. He goes, he's immature. No, I beg to differ with you. That is courage. That young man's going to live well, and he's going to be integrated and balanced. So then he goes, well, how do you know that? Well, I'm just going to tell you what I do for a living. And I tell him, he essentially tells me to off. And, and I'm walking out the, the locker room later, and this kid catches up to me, a 25-year-old, and he goes, hey, thanks for speaking up. And I go, yeah, I, I really didn't want to, but thank you. I go, why? He goes, that guy's a bully. And I go to therapy. I go, really? I go, good for you. Don't give it up. And by the way, that quarterback is a great guy. I've met him. He's a good man. And the fact that that happened on national TV and they exploit him, shame on men. Shame on us for doing that to that guy, that young man. So that's one example of the violence. The fear 
that I'm going to be vulnerable. It's the fear of vulnerability that drives male violence. And that's why so much is done in domestic violence. The fear that my wife or my partner has exposed me and I can't handle it. So I, I need to overcompensate physically and become aggressive. What are attachment styles? How can men identify them? And how do they impact relationships? We hear a lot about your love language, attachment. What I tell men, attachment styles start with how you attach yourself. And that goes back to your primary caretakers, your mom and dad or your mom or your dad growing up. And I talk about many times your present day issues with your partner started in your past. They're, they started 30 or 40 years before you met her or him. And that is the value of understanding that. And I talk about five styles in the book, anxious, avoidant, intermittent, depressed, and secure. And what I mean by anxious is that growing up, the world's not safe. There's this over um, compensation. They call them helicopter moms, helicopter dads, where, and the child grows up anxious. So it's very hard for them when they get older to have an intimate relationship where they're not suspicious, paranoid or mistrusting the next one is uh, avoidant they're cared for but there's not much emotional exchange they're cared for any strong emotions is kind of dismissed you know like is a, a true story one of my clients he's maybe seven comes home from school his childhood dog got hit by a car that day his mom sits him down in the living room and she says you know someone said listen your dog died and i'm really sorry he starts crying. She goes, okay, I'm going to go make dinner. She gets up and walks out of the living room. And he said he was there and it was terrible. You know, it's like he felt so alone. So it's been hard for him to connect to people, you know, and really have that ability, you know, to be vulnerable because he's, he avoids strong emotion. And intermittent, it's unpredictable. There's times when the mom's very engaged or the father, and then they're not. And many times, um, intermittent might be because there's drugs, alcoholism in the home, domestic violence. Things are good, and then they're not. They're good, and they're not. And that's what uh, that style does. Next one is depressed, and that's low energy. They were tired, or they didn't have the energy for you. Many times, it's not being a single parent. They just didn't have the energy, and it's very problematic. And lastly is secure, where things are predictable, you can deal with it, things work, and you can develop all these styles in your adult life. All these styles are going to uh, develop in your adult life with no problems, but knowing which one you were raised with gives you kind of a roadmap on how to go forward in your intimate relationships because attachment starts with ourselves, and once we understand that, we're able to attach and form secure, meaningful relationships with the adults in the romantic relationship we have in our life. Men have traditionally faced pressure to earn money and be good providers. How has this impacted their self-image? Earning money is fantastic. Being responsible, I call them the five Fs. Taking care of your family, your friends, your finances, the ability to have faith, and have a plan for the future. That's part of earning, but that's not the only task and many men think that's all they're worth in their family. And we know present day, women are saying, no, 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 no. I need, come on, we're in this together. And with w women entering the workforce, our job is to be more equitable and be more uh, part of a team, not just us leaving the house and coming back later. And that's part of what has been so difficult for men to understand. And your job is a piece of the puzzle, but it's not the whole puzzle. And your family, your relationship, your friends, and a lot of men in lieu of um, friendships will just forego that and just have work relationships and make work their whole life. And it's to their own detriment that happens because the money will never compensate for that void or that sense of emotional deprivation within. The role of fathers on men can't be overstated. Talk about this and explain how men can impart healthy masculinity to their sons. You know, I, I smile when I talk about this because, you, you know, one thing is to talk, you know, a lot of people talk about their mother, but for men talking about their father can be very, very loaded, you know, because by age five, 
a son knows how his dad feels about his mother, sex, women, work, being a dad, being a father. And there's three things every son wants from his father, regardless of age. And that's to feel accepted, understood, and loved. Accepted is, I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay, who I am. Understood is that it's your life, that you're not an extension of your father, you're an individual. It's so important. You know, people say, oh, I don't prove the old man wrong because they don't feel seen or understood or accepted. And lastly, feeling loved isn't, and mothers are wonderful at that, but from a father to a son, feeling loved is, I believe in you. It gives a son courage and competency to go out in the world. I have men in their 70s who still resent their dads because they never felt loved or understood. And that's why the role of the father, I tell guys, yeah, I never met my dad. You did. He was in the house, the myth. Your mom had an opinion about him. The relatives did, you know, the aunts did, the uncles. He was there, not physically, but emotionally. Nothing. People go, what about a stepdad? I love the word stepdad because many stepdads just step up and are great guys. They step up and take care of business. And you can never have enough parents in your life, good, loving parents. But those three things, and I tell fathers, that's your job. If you're doing those three things, you're paying the bills in ways you have no idea. I call that the father factor, that influence. What about mothers? How do they impact men's understanding of masculinity and self? There's always been the joke, okay, you know, don't blame your mother. But, you know, mothers are invaluable because they set the emotional attunement for her son. That relationship helps the son to understand emotions and the attunement to them, how to read people, solve problems, express yourself, how to be engaging. Because you either develop an emotional IQ with your mom or you get emotionally stuck. And many times part of the mother relationship is to empower your son emotionally, mentally, that he can handle life. He can sit with this discomfort and disappointments of life. Or opposite of that empowerment is that mother and son become enmeshed, where the son becomes her partner or her emotional support network. And that's problematic. And I tell men, if you resent your mother, stop the music because you're resenting half of yourself. And your mother, many times, she birthed you. There's a special bond there. And whether you're adopted or however it happened, that role, it's one. You only get one mother at that level. You have many mothers that love you, but learning forgiveness is part of the role of the mother-son relationship, that dance. And because as an adult man who's done this, he's an adult man. If he doesn't, he becomes a man-child. And we know that when men get married, no woman wants an adult child, a man-child. She wants a partner. Initially, it may work, but you can't replace your mother with your partner. It doesn't work. Never has, never will. That's why your relationship with your mother is so central. It helps you to individuate. Uh, you become empowered. And it deals with deprivation where you can feed yourself emotionally, not materially. Because material obsession is for a lack of emotional satisfaction. Most of the mothers I know in my practice are worried about their sons, that they're getting emasculated, discriminated against, regardless of race, creed, or color. There's so much shame for being a man. And moms, they're worried about their sons, their brothers, their cousins, their husband. And supporting and believing in your son is a superpower. It will empower your son to be okay with who he is. And having your mother's support, not that your mom's doing it for you, but your mom believes in you. And being a man's a good thing. It's not something she resents. You know, maybe she resents her father, and a lot of women have, but then they work it out and they want to empower their sons to be great, competent, um, respectable, kind men. So I find women invaluable to this process, absolutely invaluable. It's a cliche that men don't like to go to the doctors, but it's also true. Why do so many men avoid getting medical help? It's a control issue because your body doesn't lie, your body keeps the score. You can tell everybody you're healthy, whole, and complete, and you go to the doctors, your blood works off, your liver enzymes are off the roof, your cholesterol is at 1,000. Your body doesn't lie. 
And good or bad, a lot of men are in denial about their health. And there's a statistic. I heard this last year. I was listening to a, a American Medical Association. There's a thousand heart attacks in this country a day for men. Of that thousand, 900 of those men die. Of those 900, 90% had no pre existing health problems. None. And the ones that survive also had no pre existing health problems. But what they did have in common emotional trauma, a divorce, job loss, a death. And your body takes it on. Your body's meant to help you live, not be your emotional container. That's where our souls and our mind and psychology comes in. That's why men don't go to doctors because it's a 360 overview. Your doctor can tell you what's going on in your life. And now in the West, we're borrowing Eastern more where there's no compartmentalization. Psychosomatic's real. And heart attacks are a broken heart. Last week, I had a buddy of mine, dear friend, his dad died um, while he was playing tennis. Had no pre-existing health problems. And he was young. He was 60. Died in the tennis court. And they couldn't revive him. So then they do the autopsy because they had to. They, uh, the main artery in his heart was 100% clogged. 100%. And just knowing my buddy, uh, his father and his brother haven't spoken in 30 years. Terrible. I know the brother will come to the funeral. and But that's what we're talking about. You know, and there are th three ways men go. Their shoulders falling off. Their sex life doesn't work. Or their wife says, you got to go. <laughs> it's one of those three. It's usually the latter one has the most input, you know, but that's why men go. And Dr. Jesse Mills at UCLA talks about the, how men wait sometimes until it's too late, if you will. You know, they come in with level five cancer when it, they could have caught it at point zero early on. But it's a lot of avoidance. That's what it gets down to. I find that men that do go to the doctors, it's part of growing up. You're not adolescent. You're not invincible. You're not bulletproof. We have to embrace the aging process. And men that embrace that tend to have a much higher level of satisfaction, not trying to be a perpetual youth. That's great for young men, but as we get older, we need to embrace that. What do you think women need to understand about men that they don't? It's interesting. I, I get asked that question a lot. And I tell women that men and women are 95% the same and they're 5% different, but that 5% gets 95% of our attention. You know, it, it's like in firefighting, 5% 5 of the fires do 95% of the damage. That's why there's a fire truck, hook and ladder go to a, a dumpster fire versus, you know, apartment building on fire. They don't know. But one of the things is men have the same desire for relationships, emotional connection, and feelings as women do. Now, they go about it differently, but men are wired for attachment. Women are wired for attachment. We're made that way. And we desire that. But have as many times... Women think men do it through their work, and they do. But you can't marry your work. You know, it's an underrated addiction because it's socially esteemed. I tell women all the time, your husband or your partner has the same desires for intimacy that you do. And they look at me like I'm speaking Greek or Latin. They go, oh, I go, but he shows it differently. And that's where the brotherhood comes in. Men connecting with men helps us to come home and be more amenable, loving, and supportive of our partners where they're not the only significant relationship. Sisterhood gets it. Book clubs, mommy and me, you know, the get together, have coffee. Women are really good about that, staying connected. Men tend not to be that good. What is emotional sobriety and why do you encourage men to pursue it? Emotional sobriety is, that's your higher level masculinity. That's your higher level function. Because emotional sobriety, we understand sobriety physically. You, you get sober in a few weeks or a month, but it's a lifetime to get emotionally sober. And that's dealing with trauma, uh, reactions from the past. And many times if someone's raging in the present, all I tell them is the past has now become the present. Because there's nothing in this moment that would explain the level and the proportion of rage that's coming into this moment. For like a, a late, a missed appointment or, you know, you're, partners later you miss something or customer service because emotional sobriety is the ability to pause and respond to the situation as isolated because the past isn't controlling the present and that's why emotional sobriety is so important because calmness versus panic 
And when you respond, you're not reacting. It takes time not to react, but you have to know what your triggers are. You know, people say, I'm getting triggered. Okay, back up, take a breath. This is going on right now. This person doesn't know that you're beat up as a child. They don't know that. They're just being rude. Oh, okay, okay. You know, that's why it's so important. Emotional sobriety. How can men set healthy boundaries? It sounds simple. Until you learn how to say no, you don't know how to say yes. And learning how to say no starts about age five again. Because kids who don't learn how to say no, many times become people pleasers, the um, placators, seeking other people's approval. Because to say no, something would happen. They would be unloved or be abandoned. And boundaries is the ability to say no and tolerate the other person's disappointment. You know, it's very important because number two, boundaries, you know where you stop and they start. All relationships are like a tennis game. You're, you own 100 of your 50, but you stay on your side of the tennis court. You can hit the ball over. You can't run over and hit it for them. That's why boundaries are so important. I mean, the wars at world over boundaries. You know, it's, I mean, we see it on a global level. But on an interpersonal level, the ability, I tell men, to learn how to say no calmly, not angrily, as a fear of being rejected, but be able to tolerate the person's disappointment. When someone says, you're really hurting me, well, I don't mean to. I might probably disappointing you more than I'm hurting you. And that might hurt you, but that I don't mean to disappoint you, but I can't do this. And boundaries, you ask the question, okay, where am I in all this? You ask that question first before you say yes. How can a man reconcile with his estranged children? This is a big one. I find this, this time of year, uh, any time of year is big. Many times I tell men, it does not matter how you got here. You're here. And the most important thing is to take full responsibility for being the parent. It's not about the other parent or the relatives or anybody else. It's about you taking full responsibility for your actions. And that's number one being the parent, taking full responsibility. And number two, allowing them to explain to you why there's been a distance. What happened to them? Not defending yourself. You don't have to agree, but listening is curative. Listening to why they're upset and not blaming them or their mother is invaluable. You know, it's like saying, don't drink Clorox. Okay, that's smart. We know that'll kill you. Okay, blaming their mother when you're estranged from your kids You'll, whatever hope this relationship has, you just stomped it out again. And lastly, I tell them, ask one question only. What can I do if there's anything to make this relationship with you better? Is there anything I can do that can make this relationship better or change it? You don't have to answer it now. There's no pressure. That's the only question I tell men to ask. And you may get a hard no, but you still got an answer. And Rejection is not final or fatal. Our attitude about it is. And I tell men, when you're taking responsibility for everything, and you're honestly, you're not missing much. And kids know that. And responsibility breeds change behavior. You know, like they talk about in AA, amends. Amends to, is, you know, correcting relationships that were estranged. And change behavior is what most of the time kids want to see from you. I'm talking about adult children. You know, a lot of kids, you know, whatever the situation, they'll cut a parent off because they don't know what else to do. I always tell that today. They didn't know what else to do. And not, I say, as much as you personalize it, try not to. Look at when, why they had to do that. Understand what was going on in their life for them to do that. Because you're half of them. They're half of you. So there's a big reason. But it is possible, absolutely possible. Never, you know, as long as you're breathing, they're breathing, anything can happen. How do you think the Me Too movement has impacted men? Has it prompted them to rethink their ideas of masculinity and recognize male privilege? And I tell men, I think the Me Too movement is one of our best friends. They look at me like, what are you talking about? They hate men. No, they don't. They hate male privilege. They hate privilege because you make a lot of money. If guys are really honest, they do too. And that abuse, men over 35, said, time out. This doesn't work. The Me Too movement has been a wake-up call for men. It's been a blessing because we need the extreme to see where our blind spots are. 
and men over 50, there's been a privilege and a boys club attitude that's been pervasive. We know it. They know it. It's not right. You know, I used to have the, the, you know, the cautionary tale of Jeffrey Epstein. And that story is the story for us to learn from. That because you have privilege, power, money, and looks, you're not beyond the hand of justice. You're not bigger than life. And the Me Too movement is saying, guys, you got to treat us equally. I think the good outcome for men, equality. We're in this together. And men under 35 really embrace that. Men over 35 or 40 maybe chafe at that a little bit more, particularly guys over 50 going in their 60s. Like, that's not the way it's been. What well, is now? We need to evolve. And the Me Too movement called a timeout. Like, that's not going to work. Our culture is more saturated with pornography than ever. The debate around this has often been between those who have a moral argument against porn and those who see it as a free speech issue. What do we miss because of this? What is the reality of the impact of porn on men? Stepping aside from the moral or the free speech issue, I, I have young men that come in and they tell me they learned about sex education through porn. And I tell them, pornography isn't real. It isn't real life. It's not real relationships. It's entertainment. It's entertainment. Fair enough. But it's not how an intimate relationship evolves. You know, an emotional caring relationship which leads to sex and intimacy. Because the sex part's only 10% of the intimacy. It's a small portion. And I explained that the problem is not so much watching porn, it's the amount of it. Because after a period of time watching it, you begin to feel very dissatisfied. It isolates you and it impacts your relationship with your partner because that's an imaginary standard you carry now. And for men, many times they beat themselves up because their body image or their sex parts aren't big enough or whatever it may be. There's a lot major fallout from it. And what I tell men is that if you're using pornography in substitution of or your relationship with your partner, that's problematic. It's problematic. Sometimes couples like to watch it together. That's fine. But when it becomes a secret, that's a red flag. And I know there's a lot of accessibility to it, but it's when it's secretive, that's why I tell guys, then you, you got you to address it. it. It doesn't need to be a secret. The stories of Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein typify the kind of immunity that rich and powerful men often enjoy. You say that if we want these to stop, men have to change their relationship to money. How so? Part of that is money isn't success. Money is a piece of your life. It doesn't define your life. And that is a big, big difference. And men are the most critical of that. Men are the most critical of other men with money. You know, the cars, the watches, whatever it may mean. But money isn't success. Money is a, a piece of your life. Your life is within you. It's those four elements we talked about earlier. Who you are, how you treat others, your plan, your purpose, and what's the legacy you're leaving. And the other part of this is that to have balanced mental health can't be just one dimensional. Where I go to work, I eat terribly, I work 70 hours a week. It's not sustainable. And the Harvey Weinsteins and the Jeffrey Epstein, those guys are reminders that greed kills. It's a cautionary tale. We've known it since the beginning of time. It's in through every world religion. When you make that your God, capital G, it's to your own detriment. Nothing's changed. And I explained to men that believing in yourself and something bigger than you is a good antidote. Having a life plan, knowing you have a purpose. Everyone's got a purpose. Spend time. It's in there. And empathy is you realize how you impact people. And that means a lot. And the self-acceptance is that you're able to sit with your uncomfortable self, your feelings. That is the best antidote to the whole abusive cycle that we see many times in the workplace. And women are humanizing the workplace, which is great. What do you make of earlier efforts to redefine masculinity, particularly the men's movement that occurred in the 1990s? Where did they fail? Where did they succeed? I feel like they didn't fail. I feel like they're chipping away at a piece of granite. Because <laughs> prior to the 90s, Robert Bly, writing blockbuster book, Iron John, talks about the male journey. That every man needs to leave his mother's courtyard and go out into the world, plant seeds, and learn to handle disappointments and failures and get back up. He goes out as a young man. And he returns as a black knight. And the black knight is a man that knows how to reason, uh, resolve issues without force or violence. And he's able to empower others. The men's movement in the early 90s started that. And now 
like with books like mine, Modern Masculinity, is to further that, helping men become emotionally engaged and being vulnerable. Vulnerable means I can be honest about what I think, about what I feel. And that impacts my relationship with everybody in my life. And the father's role in the family will always be more than money. Your role in your family is more than money or your relationships. And that's a big piece of that, where you have all this privilege, but you're one dimensional. And ultimately, it's out of balance. It's just out of balance. It doesn't last. And the story does not end well. And yeah, I'm going to give this story. I have a lot of men that say they, they won't go to therapy. I know the questions later. They don't want to go to therapy. No, 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 no. Wife asked for three, five years. Then one day, the kids are 14 and 17. She's had it. Done. Or they've had it. And he comes home and there's a letter on, you know, the kitchen table. It says, I'm done. I moved out. Uh, speak to my attorney. That guy's in my office at 7 a.m. the next day. It's amazing how he's made time now to engage and make his family a priority. But unfortunately, 90% of the time, it's too late. The wife's done. When women beg you to do something, gentlemen, do it. Go to the therapist. I don't care if it's your hairdresser. Go. Whatever it may mean, go. Because it shows goodwill. And you're going to learn something about yourself and the relationship. And if you wait and postpone it, eventually she'll leave. And that's 70% of all divorces. Jonathan Gutman, the guru on relationships, says that. It, the 70% of divorces are a lack of vulnerability, a lack of emotional connection. The other 30% that get divorced for all, all the reasons we know. But that 70% is avoidable. And I tell that to men. When they look at Weinstein and these guys, they weren't married. They did not have good relationships. They did not have good relationships. That's not your role model. How has the internet and social media contributed to a proliferation of toxic masculinity? Toxic masculinity is the absence of compassion, empathy, accountability. And there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of guys out there that are raging against their ex-wives and they say things or against women. It's misinformation. Healthy masculinity is inclusive, not divisive. And I see them on Instagram. It's a public platform many times for men to rant with no accountability. And it's almost like they're faceless bullies. And they say things, and a lot of guys don't want to do the work, buy into it. And it's a faceless abuse. And when guys get in a certain group, and they're isolated in that group, they become maniacal. The word's used all the time. It could be narcissism, because extreme narcissism becomes toxic, where rules don't apply to me. I'm the hub. You know, I can't take feedback. I can't listen to people unless it's about me. I mean, they don't say that, but they behave that way. The other thing about toxic masculinity is they want to look perfect. Physically, emotionally, everything looks perfect. But on the inside, it's a can of worms. And that is where it's really misleading. I also tell people, if you're reading someone's stuff, and what's their credentials? What's, what's their experience? You know, And if the information is not divisive, it tends to be pretty good. But if it's divisive, it, it can be problematic. Isolation breeds m maniacal behavior out of fear. What happens is over time, doesn't work. If you're doing things that are really destructive in your relationship, you get, you're doing it to yourself. There's a lot of good stuff out there too. There really is. And a lot of young men, that's why I wrote the book, want a guidebook. Like it's okay to feel things. It's okay to express yourself and not be cutthroat, not be um, maniacal. There are other qualities that you can embrace. They'll get you where you need to go to. What challenges do you think young men face today that they didn't in earlier generations? There's their physical health, emotional health, relational, and personal. You know, it's like a 360 overview. And we call it your mental health, the invisible body you have. Because your mental health is the body. Your psychology is the hard drive. You know, it's your belief systems and narrative. And your emotions are how you translate feelings outside. You know, it's that network. But men now realize that there's a lot in here. I just, I don't want to avoid 80% of my life and say it's okay, you know, and not be cut off from themselves, you know, like cut off from the head and above, but they're below their head. They don't know what's going on inside of them. It's a challenge because um, I call it the John Wayne syndrome. 
or the Marlboro Man, you know, where you're a dude, you uh, don't talk about things. The only thing you really talk about is sports or accomplishments, <laughs> you know, and nothing wrong with that, you know, having camaraderie over that. But, you know, the Marlboro Man get a kick out of, he's riding off in the sunset by himself with emphysema. How is that a good model? He's by himself. No network, no community. And a John Wayne syndrome is, I'll fix it or, you know, my way or the highway. If that's your only tool, you don't have any tools. And I think younger men, they see their dads doing that and like, whoa, 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 whoa. My mental health is all of me. It's not compartmentalized. And I, a lot of people say it's a challenge. The challenge just comes from the older generation shaming them. Like this guy at the gym that was shaming me about that quarterback. I was indignant with him. And by the way, there's 30 guys in the room. He got intense. I, I wasn't my best self. I kind of got intense with him. And I know those guys are all looking at me like, what do you, what are you going to say to him? I'm going to say that he's not, that's his opinion. That's not the only opinion. And quite frankly, and he was incorrect. And according to the NFL, it was incorrect. Test is in the pudding. And we were correct. What he did was admirable. That's why I tell men. 360 degrees of you, not 90, not 270, all of you. And that leads to so many other great things in your life. And by the way, that leads to women respecting you. I always tell guys, you don't want your, I always ask them they're going to get married. Does she respect you? Yes. Okay. Because if she respects you long enough, she's going to love you. But you can love somebody and not respect them. And women respect a man who embraces all you know, five elements of his life for the sake of discussion. She respects that because that's courageous. And that's something that she can lean on and you can lean on her. It's very powerful. What are some misconceptions about male sexuality? I smile because I, I think one of them, or the primary one, there's a certain look for masculinity. There's as many different styles of masculinity as there are men walking the planet today. And one of the misconceptions with sexual orientation or masculinity is if you're gay, you can't be masculine. That's not correct because that many times that's a part of your expression for intimacy. Who you are as a man is who you are as a man, regardless of what your relationship is with your partner. I mean, that's personal and private. And I think that's been a very difficult task for men to embrace that, like not to do that, not to judge. There is no look or appearance with a masculine man, but there's behaviors, there's engagement, there's plenty of that, but not externally, it's internal. How do these misconceptions impact relationships? People go, well, my sex life with my partner isn't very good. And I'm like, well, good sex starts in the kitchen. It starts by emotionally talking, bonding, and being together. And that leads to a lot of good things. And that's one of the perceptions we don't hear about. You know, you know, like, where porn is just, you know, they're in the bedroom, boom. There's no warm-up. There's no connection. It just happens. And that's, generally, that doesn't work well. It doesn't go well. Sex is only a small sliver of the puzzle of intimacy. Emotional intimacy is all-encompassing, all the parts of you, and being completely vulnerable. It's very empowering and healing. And when you experience that, these misperceptions don't, they don't function because they're counterintuitive. What's the most effective way to encourage men to seek therapy? William Blake said this in 1850. Men change when the, dis here's their comfort level, when despair exceeds their comfort level. It's when despair exceeds their comfort level. Men now realize, okay, I, I need to go. I need to go. I, I got to work on this. It's like the guy, you know, his wife left him a divorce letter, you know, uh, um, served him with divorce papers. He was in absolute panic mode at whatever it took to heal this repair he was going to do it that's despair and despair is we throw everything out the window okay what do i need to do and that's when men go to therapy as i say let's go to therapy before you have leukemia okay let's go back let's not wait till you're you're so sick you can't get up metaphorically because people have um trainers at the gym because they want to do better or they have golf coaches you know different things like that a therapist is a, a psychological guide to help you find your best self, help you get there. I think life coaches are great to help you implement. And a therapist takes a deeper into who you are 
in how to maximize him, how to find him. That's what therapy is. And there's a clip on John Hamm on Gordon Bensinger's show about why he went to therapy after Mad Men ended. He said, it helped me get a different perspective. Help me get my head around some stuff I couldn't see on my own. Seeing the, the therapist at that time was profoundly helpful because it is it does what it does. It gives you another perspective on something that you can't quite figure out. And she was able to really kind of, uh, again, reorient my, my kind of way of thinking. Therapy is like, I can touch the back of my head. I can feel it, but I can't see it. A therapist will help you see that blind spot. And it, it really helps you to reorient and redirect your life. It's very, it takes courage and it's empowering. How can you get men to be vulnerable in a relationship? I think part of it is many times I tell your part, I tell the partner, be the lead, take the lead and talk to them about that. But I think ultimately partners find people that they're, it's equitable with. And I think having a safe place to talk will get men to do it and not to be judgmental and that many times men who have close male friends have a much easier time being vulnerable because they do it with the, the guys. They see themselves with the eyes of other men. It's much easier. You know, seeing yourself through the eyes of a woman is important, but you have to see yourself through the eyes of a man because that is the doorway to vulnerability, being honest, who I am. And I tell women that if you're their husband's best friend, that's not good. You can't be his only friend. He's got to develop other friends because there won't be that intimacy. It's too much. One relationship can't pay all the bills. It can't take care of everything. Men who start to develop relationships outside with other men do very well. They learn to be organically be more open. Is masculinity defined by sexual orientation? No, not at all. <laughs> I don't mean to be so blunt. No, not at all. It, it isn't. It's masculinity, it's who you are. Sexual orientation is a piece of who you are. It's not the whole package. Older men have been merciless with other men who are vulnerable or talk about their feelings. Men don't cry. Don't be a sissy. Get some backbone. But that's not true. Whether you're gay, straight, or otherwise, you still have to deal with what's inside of you. And that's not going away because your sexual orientation. And I think a lot of guys will be hypersexual, heterosexuals, as, as a way of trying to offset this shame or uneasiness, this dis-ease within them. And I say, you can't sleep your way through healing. You have to walk your way through it. You have to embrace it. You can't sleep your way through your trauma or your child abuse. You've got to walk through it. And that's where that is masculinity, separating the past from the present and working through those issues. And a lot of things come out of that. How are masculinity and mental health related? They're inseparable. It's the same coin, different sides. Because your mental health is this invisible body, like we've been saying, and masculinity is an expression of who you are in your own style. It's just, it's part of who you are. It's like trying to separate your white and red blood cells without a microscope. You can't do it. It's just part of your blood, your life blood. And your masculinity and all the different pieces of you are one and the same. You know, it's who you are. And that's why I talk about these four horsemen. Everyone hears the word self-acceptance. The definition I give it is learning to sit and be comfortable with the parts you don't like. Not the parts you like, the parts you don't like. And over time, hugging the cactus breeds humility. And that's a superpower. And that allows you to be empathetic and understanding of others. It's not sympathy. It's that you can identify with them, be supportive, not carry the, their load, understand that and that leads you to a purpose and finding a goals for your life and also you realize your life's important and you're part of something bigger part of the bigger world part of the bigger collective unconscious that's really valuable mindfulness these are all pieces of masculine regardless of what your orientation is so i think a lot of hetero guys are scared of what they feel inside homophobia it, it's fear of maybe i am okay all right that's fine but who are you is more importantly, you know, that's on the outside. Who, what's going on, on the inside? Why is self-acceptance important to a man's career? You're not going to get it with the corner office or the CEO title or the CFO title. 
when a man is content with himself, he's also able to be content with others. And as a mentor, empowering them, compassion, people love that. They love a business partner or a relationship with a partner, business person, where there is that kindness. It doesn't mean they're not shrewd and good business people, but self-acceptance allows, I'm not seeking your approval. I've got it. In fact, I can be better for you, understand what you need and the needs you have, because I'm not trying to fill my own. You see CEOs, they have that. It's not arrogance. It's self-acceptance. And they like other people. And relationships are valuable. Because the best relationship you ever have is with yourself and to your higher self. Those two are in place. Your career is going to do very well. You'll do very well. What is masculine shame? It's always been around, particularly in the last five years, where men, they don't really know who they are. They are embarrassed for being a man. They're embarrassed for being a man being a man or this, that, or mansplaining, all this kind of pushback. And I understand why that's there. But masculine shame is a red light that, or a signal that you need to go inside and get comfortable with who you are. Not look for it outside. Get comfortable with what's going on inside of you. Because shame says we're defective. We're not good enough. You're a man. I'm not good enough. I'm terrible. Guys suck. That's not true. You don't suck. That's what matters. And if you don't suck, maybe you can help others not to. That's masculine shame. Why are men so afraid of intimacy? You know, I, I've said this many times. It sounds so simple, vulnerable, because you're going to see who I am. And many men, because they haven't, they don't feel like they're good enough. It sounds repetitive, but it's very powerful. You know how two magnets get close and they repel each other? Unless you've dealt with your shame, intimacy is like this. They're incompatible. You got to pull the roots the weeds out of the garden in order to plant seeds of intimacy because intimacy is vulnerability. Yeah. I'm not perfect. I'm good enough, but I'm not perfect. Yeah. Sometimes I get moody, I get irritable, but there's an acceptance and that allows your partner to be a human with you. It's a very strong bond. There's a lot of mutual respect comes out of that. Intimacy is incompatible with shame. It's one or the other. Only one boss is going to drive that train. It's either part of it's being intimate and healing or the shame. They cannot coexist. Oil and water will never mix. Shake it up as much as you want, and they'll separate within a second. As does shame and intimacy. They always separate you and isolate you. And while we're on that, I just want to say this. One of the problems with men now isn't so much being depressed. It's isolating, loneliness. And shame drives men away thinking, I'm not good enough. Oh, they don't love me. No one likes me and they withdraw and that's dangerous. I tell guys, don't, don't go into hiding. Don't cut yourself off. You know, you have a good friend, keep that lifeline going because shame will isolate you. And intimacy is the opposite side. It'll empower you. You feel better. Your health is better. Your life is better. You know, you, your quality of life improves. Shame deteriorates all that. How does a man know when he needs professional help? There's many things. Sometimes chronic flatness, just feeling flat. There's no joy. It's like soda, you know, it, it still has a taste, but it's flat. Or there's a persistence of despair for no external reason, for no reason at all. And there's ongoing hopelessness. Even though, yeah, things are good, but there's a part of you that just feels hopeless. Maybe you're a certain age or something's happened and lots of something big is happening in your life. Kids graduate, move away. Kids move back home. Your elderly parents die. Uh, major life transitions are usually a very good sign for to go. You know, a lot of guys get into retirement and they have such a hard time because it's such a transition. That's when you go to therapy. helps help you talk it through because you have a lot of feelings unexpressed. Another one is a major sickness. You know, it could be your partner. It could be you, your children, a dear friend. That impacts you. And talking that through helps you to understand yourself and to be uh, of help to the other person. Another one I tell guys, if you're going through a divorce, get in therapy. What did you learn in this relationship? Don't go replace it. Don't go put another face on an old issue. Whatever it is, you pick this person. There's a reason why you picked them. Find out why. And that's way beyond blaming. That's taking responsibility. I tell guys, if you're going through a breakup, get into therapy. 
so you can amend and learn something. And lastly, you want to feel better. You just want to feel better. That's a good enough reason. It's like why people exercise. They want to feel better. They know it's valuable. Therapy is um, emotional exercising, psychological getting fit. Is that you have resiliency. All these issues, all these symptoms, your partner's not your therapist. Your friends aren't. They can be supportive. But on a deeper level, you need to sit down with someone and make that connection and talk it through. When it becomes three-dimensional, it's very powerful. Very powerful. How can I reconcile with my father? I tell men, your father may have died 10 years ago, or he may be living. Regardless, the man that you're enraged with is in here. He generally is not out there. You know, he might be in his 80s. He's a different guy than he was 40, 50 years ago. I think it's important for men to many times write a letter to him. Now, that doesn't imply that you mail it. But let write down what it is with your dad, what you always wanted from him. And it goes back to those three key things I always tell guys, acceptance, understanding, and love. And tell guys that your dad didn't have children to reject you or to hurt you. And it's not a, it's not a play game, but forgiveness is the greatest act of courage you'll ever commit. And that doesn't mean you have a close relationship with him, but you forgive him so it's no longer controlling your life. Forgiveness is for you. And anger can only get you so far. And then after anger comes forgiveness. And I tell men, I hate my dad because he left my mom and did this, that, and the other. Okay, it's over. You replaying it isn't going to make it better. is isn't going to change the story. And how you feel about your father is going to impact how you treat your son and your daughter and the other men in your life in your close relationship. You know, it's like non-smoking areas. We learn you can't contain smoke and you can't contain anger or resentment. It goes everywhere. And if your father is alive and you had the opportunity to speak with him, I would do it. Swallow the ego, swallow the pill. He's not going to always be here. And they always say, what's the worst thing in life? Regret. Because there's things about your dad you don't know. As much as you know, you don't know everything. That's all I want to tell you. I, I tell guys, find a way to forgive him. And you're better for it. And he'll feel the energy. How can I make peace between my spouse and my mother? <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, Houston, we have a problem. Okay, <laughs> we have a problem. If this goes back to when you're married or you, you're married. Your wife is number one. And the reason why there's conflict, you have not set that boundary with your mother. You have got to leave the mothership. You've got to unplug from it. And it's not like degrees. It has to be you unplug and learn to tolerate your mother's disapproval that you're not there for her. You are her son, but you're now married. And that's our job as parents to launch our children. If there's conflict, I tell guys, it's because you're not setting your wife up as number one. You're not setting the boundaries. Letting your mom know, mom, mom, you don't get to call. I tell my wife that she's doing a bad job with me. We're not doing that. And you don't make your mother a priority over your wife on Mother's Day. Not a good idea. You can honor your mom, but you got to take care of your wife. She's taking care of the kids. I tell guys, that's really important. But if there's a conflict, it's because we as men have not established that clear demarcation in the sand. We have not done the chalk lines. They're not clear. And ultimately, your wife doesn't want to be a replacement part. And your mom, well, she won't let go. That's not true. You keep it going. No is no. You have to learn how to do it. Regardless of culture, race, creed, or color, every man has to do it to, a, to varying degrees. So I recommend that that goes back to setting boundaries with your mother. Sometimes I feel like a financial failure. How do I deal with these emotions? That's a really good one because – Measuring, comparing yourself against others, you know, there's only one outcome, despair. And many times, you know, men lose their job in their 40s, 50s, or, you know, get laid off or something, and they feel terrible. It's not about being a failure. It's what you do with that opportunity to change. And again, money is not a measurement. Your net worth is not your self-worth. Your self-worth is inside of you. Your net worth is just something outside of you. It doesn't rule you. Yeah, it may feel good, but at the end of the day, what comes after money? You. You. You're always there. And why hear men say they're a financial 
failure because they haven't accepted what's inside of them yet. They haven't done the work. Yeah, the, I'm not saying there's an ebbs and flows and financial mistakes and whatnot. A failure is when you stop trying. And number two, when you don't learn from it. That's a failure. And that is the key to overcoming financial despair. And also to talk through with your partner. You know, she's part of the team too. But I tell men, if you're calling yourself a failure, that's the 15-year-old in you. That's not the adult man talking. Because it's much bigger than that. Your life's much bigger than that. 